Hey, Bridget here. So as y'all know, this is one of my favorite times of year in the DMV area. And like many of y'all, I am busy planning weekend getaways to make sure that I can soak in all the area has to offer. That's why I'm so excited to plug one of Congress's latest national heritage areas in Southern Maryland's Calvert, Charles, St. Mary's, and Southern Prince George counties. So discover the area's heritage, scenic waterfront, and countless breweries, distilleries, and wineries. Learn more and discover where time and tide meet at DestinationSouthernMaryland.com. Today on CityCast DC, the DC police have been trying to fire an officer named Michael Thomas for 13 years. But even though the brass has decided that they don't want him on the street, Thomas has managed to appeal and arbitrate his way out of being definitively sacked. It's a tale of public safety, organized labor, and how the city government works or doesn't. And Alex Coma from City Paper has reported the whole crazy story. Today is Tuesday, May 16th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. So, Alex, who is Officer Michael Thomas? And why has DC's police department been trying to fire him for 13 years? <laughs> yeah, well, he he used to be a uh, Metropolitan Police Department officer. He has not been for some time, sort of stemming from this incident back in uh, 2009, where um, he was woken up in the middle of the night at his home in Hyattsville. Here's a man outside uh, his house. He sort of sees him uh, messing with his car. He's not sure whether he's trying to break into it or not. Uh, the man in question, Julio Lemus, uh, says that uh, he was trying to, uh, let's say, relieve himself after a night of drinking. But Michael Thomas didn't know that. He goes outside with his uh, service weapon, tells him to uh, get away from his car. The accounts sort of differ at this point, but the end result is that he walks a little closer to Julio Lemus and uh, shoots him twice, uh, sends him to the hospital for a few months. Uh, they later find that Julio was um, completely unarmed and was probably doing exactly what he said he was doing. This leads to a, a cascading series of investigations by MPD that lead to uh, his superiors recommending um, that he get fired. Um, but as you say, that um, has never really happened. So what did happen? <laughs> so basically, the police discipline system in D.C., much like many cities around the country, um, because of uh, police union bargaining, um, is, is very complex. They have different rights than other city employees. So even though his bosses didn't want him on the force anymore, they found that his use of force was um, unjustified. He took his appeal all the way up to the chief of police, um, who agreed that he should indeed be fired. But because of those rights, he was able to take the case to a, a neutral Yuban uh, arbitrator. After many years of back and forth, the arbitrator says other uh, officers in other instances like this one, they got suspended instead of fired. Um, and so that's a, a more legitimate punishment. But uh, D.C.'s police department is able to appeal that ruling, which they've been doing now for, I think it's been six years um, since the initial court process started. And it's, it's still going. And has he been drawing a paycheck the whole time? So uh, this is where it gets a little complicated. He has not been on the force, and so he has not been getting a standard paycheck. But one of the things that is at the center of this that folks are fighting about and often happens in, in long, drawing out cases like this one is that officers are eligible to receive some amount of back pay. This is a, a problem that has been documented in great detail by the D.C. auditor and others, um, sort of showing that in long, drawn out cases like this one, officers can be eligible for years of back pay. Now, the question of how much Michael Thomas is going to get is kind of up in the air. To be clear, in the meantime, over these years, he hasn't been getting like a two every two weeks into his bank account paycheck. Nope. Nope. Presumably had to find um, another job. We weren't able to find Michael Thomas, so we don't know what he's been doing. So you painted this picture of the police department over and over again saying this guy should not be on the force. We do not want him on the force. We do not want him armed among the citizenry. And it goes up to the chief. It goes through various administrators, uh, some of whom may know him, some of whom presumably were just looking at the documentation of the case. And an outside arbitrator eventually says, no, you all are wrong. He should stay on the force. What was the argument for why he should stay? Yeah, it was essentially that, you know, 
he uh, acted in the heat of the moment that, um, you know, it's what anybody would have done if they were in his situation. And probably most importantly, you know, when it comes to labor law, they were pointing to other incidents, other uses of force, where he's only been a cop for, I think, two years by the time this happened. So they said, he maybe he needs more training. If you look at other instances like this, um, we simply need to give him more training to know not to shoot um, an unarmed man outside his house. So they, they were not- He's peeing on his car. Yeah, exactly. They were not strong arguments, but I mean, the arbitrator is looking at, at black and white labor law. I mean, you know, it's part of what makes this process feel so absurd and, and kind of disconnected from reality. It's It's not- at a certain point, it becomes less about what happened that night and more about the, the rules about union grievances and, and all the rest. So this is sort of like a thing with MPD. I remember the D.C. auditor released a report in like October that said the department was forced to rehire 37 different officers between, I don't know, in the last like six years uh, before that. And they got millions of dollars in back pay. And it was all sort of situations like this, where the department had decided this person should not be entrusted with a badge and a gun. And they went through the arbitration process and an arbitrator found otherwise. Why so many and what's going on? Yeah, well, as I sort of mentioned earlier, a lot of it comes down to the fact that the union has bargained for this arbitration. It's this extra step that can supersede what the chief of police wants to do. It's driven police chiefs in D.C. and elsewhere crazy. I mean, whether it's Kathy Lanier, I was on the phone with Pete Newsham about it, Robert Conti, who's getting ready to leave MPD. They all really dislike the system because it means that when they decide they don't want a cop as part of their department, they're not the final say on it. So because this independent arbitrator gets to come in here, it becomes a union process with union lawyers representing these cops. And they're fighting for the principle as much as anything else, the principle that they want to protect their members, regardless of whatever officers have done. And in the cases that Kathy Patterson, the auditor, dug up, I mean, some of them are even worse, um, you know, more egregious examples of this one, guys accused of domestic violence and, and things like that. Do you believe these people are a threat to public safety? I mean, I think it's certainly worth asking the question. I mean, if you've got a guy in the case of Michael Thomas that is just shooting an unarmed man, you know, late at night in a jurisdiction where he's not even a cop, it really makes you wonder what he's doing when he does feel he has the full sort of authority of D.C., you know, invested in him. I think that a lot of people are frustrated about this outcome, um, whether it's from the D.C. council uh, to the police chiefs on down and to the extent that the council is literally trying to change it. I mean, they are, are in the midst of, of fighting to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. So in the case of Michael Thomas, now an arbitrator has ruled that he should be reinstated. Is there any recourse left to the MPD to not have him back? Yeah. I mean, as I said, the court process is still playing out. Um, it's gone all the way up to D.C.'s Court of Appeals, which is its highest court. They've kicked it back down to the Public Employee Relations Board, which reviews disputes like this. Now D.C. is appealing again to the Superior Court. I mean, they could keep doing this for quite some time. And, and some people have suggested to me, particularly those on the union side of things, that this is a, a tactic by MPD, that they're essentially stalling for so long, they know they're probably not going to win these appeals because of the way the law is written, but by doing this, they can effectively keep the guy off the force in perpetuity. And, and it's like we were talking about, he hasn't been drawing a paycheck. By necessity, he's had to go do something else. So even if he wins at the end of all of this, at the end of a 20-year saga, I mean, it's very reasonable to expect that he won't want to come back and be a cop anymore. He may be in a different career entirely. I've taken 20 years of a paycheck. Uh, that would make <laughs> me want to retire. <laughs> Cold War era defectors sold secrets outside the British embassy on Mass Ave. Allied operatives met at the Mayflower Hotel in 1925 and again in 2010. And odds are there was a spy on your train this morning. With more than 10,000 spies, D.C. truly is the capital of spycraft. And if you want to understand their secrets, step into their radio transmitting shoes or into James Bond's Aston Martin, you need to visit the International Spy Museum. Located just off the National Mall, the Spy Museum features two floors of exhibits and artifacts. They've got ciphers, submarines, and the actual ice axe that killed Leon Trotsky. While most DC museums discouraged me from touching the artwork, the Spy Museum gave me an undercover identity and tested my skills as a covert operative in a series of interactive challenges. Book your visit today at spymuseum.org. 
when these officers get rehired, like these 37 that the auditor had mentioned, do they get put on desk duty or do they go right back on the street like a regular officer with no blemish? It varies. I think sometimes you do see um, the the department trying to find ways to sort of minimize their exposure. A not uncommon occurrence as well is that they will essentially rehire them for one day and then they will say, here's a settlement. Here's all the back pay that you accrued. Just go away, basically. And that Mm -hmm. does happen. Um, Not always. But sometimes, yeah, I mean, sometimes they do go back on the force MPD has been dealing with attrition issues. They are not in a position to be turning away too many officers at this point. And so, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's not all the time because the department has a lot of mechanisms sort of informally um, if they don't want to see a a cop on the street interacting with people after some of these incidents. But it's definitely not never. I assume this entire administrative process with the trials, with the arbitration, with the appeals is pretty expensive. Who is paying yeah, I mean it's it's the city, um, and you know, it, in many Meaning cases, you and me. Yeah, indeed. I mean, us us taxpayers are footing the bill for all of this. In many cases, not only uh, are they paying for MPD is represented by the city; they're represented by the office of the attorney general, essentially DC's lawyers. In many cases, um, there's back pay for the officers themselves, and in some cases, um, this is a, a real possibility. In the Michael Thomas case. The police union will be able to ask a judge for um, attorney's fees uh, for their money that they spent on. um, They have a few law firms that represent them frequently in this case. So cost is very. But I mean, it's it's in the millions of dollars for each case. I mean, think about how how much it takes to hire a lawyer for 15 years in this case alone. Frankly, I mean, I I think that it's, it's probably no secret that the folks at the Office of Attorney General would be doing a lot of other things with their time if they could. So it's sort of an opportunity cost as well. So let me ask you the contrarian question, which I hear sometimes, which is progressive minded Washingtonians are generally all for public employee unions. One of the things any union does and should do is have the backs of its members, protect them from arbitrary firing, arbitrary punishment by bosses who might not like them, who might make up some fake workplace excuse in order to carry out a personal vendetta. That's what your union's there for. And what it does is, through the contract process, create a whole system of arbitration and appeals and so on designed to make sure that firings happen for fair reasons. And that is, you have recourse to that if they try to fire you. This is what happened to Michael Thomas, and he took advantage of the recourse that he was legally entitled to. And he uh, is apparently... uh, going to be reinstated if, if, uh, if the most recent rulings uh, have anything to say about it. What's the complaint? I mean, if you're for public employee unions, isn't part of the deal that it makes it harder for people to be fired just because the bosses say that person is no good? Should it be any different for cops? Yeah, this is a really good point and, and really key to a lot of this. So You're absolutely right. Cops are public employees. Public employees do have different rights. The difference is arbitration. Arbitration adds years to these processes. Whereas if Michael Thomas was just, you know, your average, uh, you know, trash collector or something, he would be able to appeal his ruling to that public employee relations board. Then you can appeal up to the courts. You've got some recourse here if you're a, a regular public employee. The difference is that cops have more rights than your average public employee. They have this extra level that will add years to the process, going to the arbitrator, then appealing the arbitrator's ruling. This is is the key that several people have, have drawn out to me, is that cops aren't arguing for the same rights as everyone else. They're arguing for a special class of rights that only they have, and that many feel that the union abuses. I mean, in this case, the union waited six years in between asking for arbitration and filing its first papers. That seems like it was such a crazy delay that the arbitrator first assigned to the case died in the interim of (laughs) when this case could proceed. That is a very different process than what every other public employee in D.C. enjoys. Well, and then this is happening. Your story runs against the backdrop of a moment when the city is trying to hold on to police reforms it enacted. The face of opposition to these reforms is the police union, the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police. This is a union that has been super controversial, that has been, by 
in some tellings, a nest of Trumpists who were sympathetic in some cases to the insurrection and have argued that the various police reforms actually are going to make it the job of police harder. And your reporting has shown how they have drawn out the cases of people who the department has deemed to be bad and dangerous cops. Is this organization good for the city, for the citizens, for the, the taxpayers? I think that there are many ways in which you could argue that they are not. I think that, um, as you mentioned earlier, any union is entitled to defend their members. They are going to have to take extreme positions because you've got to stick up for every single member. That is the point of the union. I absolutely understand. So you've got to defend that. the principle, even if it's a, even if the particular exactly. example is someone who's kind of a exactly. Turkey. But this has gone, and and particularly uh, as you allude to, under the leadership of the current chair, Greg Pemberton, it has gone in in another direction. And I think that what you're seeing play out in Congress um, when it comes to their interference in in, um, DC affairs is a really good example of this. I think that it is pretty undeniable that the union has had a big role in getting House Republicans to focus on DC's crime legislation. And that includes this provision that Congress is still considering right now that would block DC from banning arbitration. They have passed police reforms. In fact, they passed them in the wake of uh, the George Floyd protests in 2020, and, and it's taken years to actually implement. They've passed reforms that would remove um, the arbitration from something that the police union can bargain for. It would essentially give the police chief the power to set up the police discipline system. And they would almost certainly get rid of arbitration. But the union has been arguing to the House GOP in particular that this would somehow make D.C. less safe. And pretty much no one thinks that that is the case, up to and including police chiefs themselves. And to me, it just is a really indicative of how disingenuous some of their arguments about raising concerns about rising crime rates in the city are. That is a problem, but getting rid of arbitration, making it easier for the city to fire bad cops, that to me really seems like beyond the bounds. And yet we see, you know, they've hired a lobbying firm. They're trying to convince the Senate to do as the House did and, and block this measure, which essentially has nothing to do with rising crime in D.C. and everything to do with protecting their members. It's an irony because the right wingers who are ordinarily very much behind the position that we should make it easier to fire civil servants. In this case, the position is reversed. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it creates a really weird dynamic that I think, you know, it is one of the reasons why this issue remains so complex. It doesn't fall along the normal battle lines. You can't retreat to your normal talking points, depending on, you know, where on the ideological spectrum that you fall. And it, it's part of why we've gotten to this situation where we are now, where things are just kind of stuck. And again, it's also taking place against a backdrop of they need to either hire or retain more cops. And so it's probably not a great time to be at war with the police's representatives. Yeah. And this is part of what is interesting is in the debates happening um, on the Hill in Congress, you've got House Republicans sort of railing against D.C., saying you're not doing enough to protect the city from uh, violent crime. That's why they feel they need to step in and pass these sorts of bills. And the mood in D.C. has taken definitely a more pro-police turn, I would argue, after the reform energy that came out of George Floyd. They've been trying to be on the side of their department. The, the mayor in particular has been agitating for more police hiring. The council has largely gone along with the things that she's asked, but for a few things here and there. I mean, they are, you know, they're saying, work with us here. We just don't want there to be cops that have killed unarmed people on the force. And their position is is rather absolute in that regard. They, they are trying to be on their side and sort of strike a balance. And they are turning that effort away and saying, we will accept nothing less than getting what we want here. Alex, thanks so much for being here. It was a pleasure. And before you go, lead producer Priyanka Tilbey is here with some quick news. Mayor Muriel Bowser has proposed a new crime bill to D.C. Council. It's called the Safer, Stronger D.C. legislation, and it hopes to increase public safety with several changes, like making strangulation a type of felony assault, 
increasing penalties for illegal gun possession and for violent crimes that target people with disabilities, and increasing reimbursements for private security cameras. Crime is definitely the topic of the week. Bowser is heading to the Hill today to testify about it before Congress. Check out our episode about the hearing in the show notes. Also, on Friday, a Prince George's County man was arrested for kidnapping and assaulting a woman in a U-Haul truck. It's a pretty gruesome story. It was an attempted traffic stop, which led to a police chase, after which police found the woman in the back of the truck. She says she was kidnapped at a convenience store in Southeast D.C. The 62-year-old suspect faces dozens of charges, including assault, kidnapping, and driving while impaired. Finally, the Federal Railroad Administration released a new revised plan for the revamp of Union Station. It's projected to cost $8.8 billion and will be completed by 2040. The original plan had been criticized for being too car-centric, so the new proposal includes less parking, an underground drop-off area, and an integrated bus terminal. There'll be two public hearings next month, and the FRA is welcoming public comment on the plan until July 6th. This plan means big things for the iconic station, but also it's a transformation for the entire neighborhood. We covered these changes in an episode, so check out the show notes for that one too. That is all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to the morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye.